Well, good morning again. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, I was liking June. It looks like June's going to go bad over this next week. Uh, Of course, if you're the person that loves 90 degrees and 90% humidity, this is the week for you. Right, this coming up here. Uh, It's my least like part of the summers in Ohio, uh, is having the nice sweaty seasons that are out there. Uh, So, but I hope you enjoy that. It's good weather to get out and do some swimming if you're a swimmer. Uh, but it's going to be a nice warm one. I want to encourage you, as you think about uh, here at Emmanuel, as you think about the anniversary that's coming up, um, especially to the event on Sunday, I would encourage you to invite people to come and attend and to be a part of this uh, celebration with us. Um, I'm going to go grab my mother from uh, the Southern Ohio and bring her up here for two days of festivities. I told her there was going to be dancing, so she said, I'm in uh, with that. And so we're going to bring her up. Uh, we hope we don't know yet. We hope the wheelers might be able to come. Uh, they've been facing some physical challenges, but we hope especially that Margaret can come. Uh, and so we hope that we'll have uh, some of them to be with us to recall uh, God's goodness. Uh, I was thinking yesterday as I was at the wedding, uh, we were talking about some individuals uh, uh, who had been a part of the OS and SO home, uh, the Ohio soldiers and sailors orphanage then it became ohio veterans children's home and the genesis of this church is tied to a ministry to that orphanage so lake street baptist church was where they kind of got started and their real burden was to minister to the orphans at the uh, ovch and so that property interestingly enough has been a part of emmanuel baptist almost for all of its history not only at the beginning but then of course as the church grew and then spawned its own school and now the school that's there that's legacy is this church the school that was spawned in this church uh, and still having people who teach there at the school so we've been on that legacy property uh, for a long period of time and so may god help us to continue to love on people in need well where we are uh, is uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to Titus chapter 2 today, Titus chapter 2, uh, and we're in a series that's trying to recall the ways in which it has seemed to, to use a phrase from Acts chapter 15, uh, the earliest church council, uh, as we look back over the history of Emmanuel, uh, ways that it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us uh, to take particular directions or make particular emphases, or to sustain particular uh, activities over the course of uh, our time as a church. And we want to give glory to God for that. We want to recognize uh, that God has been at work among His people, and we also want to set a trajectory that hopefully this will be true of us in the future, uh, that we're listening to what God wants to do, we're paying attention to His priorities, and that we're doing uh, what God would ask us to do. Uh, Throughout Scripture, the activity of remembering is an essential thing to a healthy follower of Christ. Uh, One of the things that uh, is a part, I think, of being fallen, of being broken, of being sinful, is forgetting things that are important and getting caught up with things that are immediate or urgent uh, and forgetting to set your life in the context of the things that really matter. And of course, right at the heart of the church is an act of remembrance. It's interesting that Jesus asks us as his people right, to regularly what? Remember his death on the cross and proclaim it until he comes. And so we want to be people who are faithful to call out. Uh, We want to recognize that where we are uh, as a church by God's grace, that we still exist. As we mentioned earlier, uh, the promise that Jesus made to uh, the church, the church universal to everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, that his program in this age until he returns will not fail. Christ will move forward, his church will prevail, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But that does not mean that individual bodies of believers would not fail. It does not mean that a a church may find itself in a country that it is almost persecuted out of existence. That's not what the promise entails. It doesn't uh, cover the idea that you may have people infiltrate a church and lead it astray from its identity and mission which we see already happening in the New Testament in the books of Jude and 2 Peter, right? So Jesus' promise to uh, maintain uh, his church does not mean that every little local group of believers who organize themselves are going to exist in perpetuity, right? All we have to look at in particular, right, uh, Pastor Steve, he's often in the Middle East, 
And of course, the Middle East was where the church was birthed, where the church extended its reach, where it had large churches in Corinth, in Thessalonica, in Macedonia, in Greece. And today, the church is but a whisper in those places in terms of its existence. So, we want to remember that, and we want to call ourselves back to these. Now, today, I'm going to read a passage that on every level is radical. Now, I'm going to say it's radical in the West. It's not radical in most of the world, but almost everything this passage is going to talk about is radical. Uh, Almost everything it's going to assume about men and women is perceived as bigoted and prejudiced and radical in our contemporary moment. And for you as a follower of Christ, this is one of the reasons why I want to read it, I want to talk to you about it, and I want to talk to you about it in a way that may even be surprising in terms of what I come away with it at the end, Uh, because we live in a world where now, right now, to treat your children that their biological sex actually gives them a real clue to their identity is to be a parent who may be even bigoted or harmful in terms of that. And we may even encourage our professionals to encourage kids to detach their biological identity from their gender in such a way that they can explore it so that recently, even recently, in certain environments where you wouldn't expect it, celebrating we are in the month of June, my birthday month, which is also the Gay Pride Month. And we're celebrating, and one of the, one of the acts of celebration major networks is playing the story of a family who encouraged their son, their daughter, to transition into a son before the age of five. Okay. And so where we are at the moment in terms of who we are as the people of God, how we talk to one another, how our kids who live out on the TikTok world, where some of the most prominent voices are transgender voices, who are promoting particular views of what it means to be male and female, or the fact that there is nothing really to male and femaleness other than what I make it be, right? And it's super influential. Uh, Many parents here, you don't live on TikTok. You may enjoy some of the silly cat reels and things that come off of that, but those aren't the major voices that are affecting the lives of our own children in terms of the dynamics of where we're going. So I want to read this passage to you, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me, right? I'm going to give you some good standing work today. You've been up and down. But I'm going to read all of Titus chapter 2. And we need to read it all together because it's one tight literary unit here. So here's beginning Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from the NIV, and we'll begin with verse 1. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, speaking to Titus, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So I've titled this year, It Seemed Good to Us to Raise Up Gospel-Shaped Men and Women, right? Gospel-Shaped Men and Women. 
Now, I want you to look at the structure of Paul's little letter here. Uh, some of you, if you, you remember, when we went through the, the book of Titus, uh, you remember Titus is there trying to establish a church that there ex- there's some believers that exist, but there's no leadership structure, there's no organization. And so Paul sent Titus there to establish a church when there wasn't any kind of structure, any kind of organization that's there. And on top of that, he sent him to a culture that, if you want to say it, was very morally impoverished. And he quotes one of their own poets. You can look back in chapter 1 and verse 12, and he quotes one of their own poets, and uh, uh, the Paul says they're liars. In the ancient world, the Cretans were renowned for being liars. People who intentionally, and to use the term liar, psustes, is someone who intentionally deceives someone else. Not someone who says a falsehood and they're unaware of it, but they were known to be manipulators, uh, people who were trying to work people to get the best deal in terms of their island of Crete deals. So they were liars. They were lazy. They were known as a group of people who lived off of the trade that literally floated to their shores. Uh, They didn't produce anything, and they handled goods, and they were known for people who were not industrious. And then thirdly, they were known for their sexual debauchery. They were evil beasts. That's the phrase that the the, uh, poet uses. And the thing about that, when Paul ends and he quotes the poet, you may say, well, at least he let that poet say it. Well, then right after Paul lets the poet say it, then Paul goes, and he was spot on. So that's a Christian analysis. It's not an imperialistic sort of cultural dominance. It's not some Jew trying to lord himself over Gentiles. It's a believer in Christ who's evaluating the health of a culture from the perspective of what God has created them to be and wants to redeem them to become. And so Titus is in a situation, this is where he tells Titus that if you're going to speak to them, you've got to be prepared for the fact that you're going to step into a group of people that almost everything you're going to say to them is going to sound crazy. It's going to sound crazy, right? And one of the things here that we don't think about, one of the things that was well known in Crete, the laziness, there was a party kind of culture, and it was known for women being drunk. It was also known for a high degree of pederasty, of the sexual abuse of children by adults, right? So that's the ancient Crete that, that Titus is now planted in. Now, I just want to say to you, right, and I'm not trying to be, uh, to overstate it, is where we are in the West is not that far from where Titus is. It's not very far, right? When we have to have discussions about why it's not good to have uh, men dressed in drag performing for uh, elementary kids, we've got something that's seriously wrong. Seriously wrong, right? Now, uh, these are, right, drag, if you know drag, it's, it's, it's part of the gay lifestyle, and so it's usually gay men behaving in very sexually bawdy ways for boys, not girls. But on the other hand, if we had men behaving that way toward little girls, there would be an outrage, So that's where we are. So where we are as a culture, when that's being invited by schools, public entities into their schools, right? So they're not breaking into schools. They're being invited by schools. Thank God that's not any a part of what's happening in Xenia. Thank God that's not not a part of it. But it's what's happening in our culture around us. And so when we live in that kind of environment, when you come to read this passage, it seems, especially if you're reading it from the outside, like this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. It sounds like a whole bunch of constraints on my life that's robbing me of life. I can't be my authentic self. But of course, the whole biblical wager is the God who created you knows your authentic self. And through Christ, he's trying to free you from the bondage of your fallen sinful desires and reclaim your true identity. And so what we find here is a call to our true identity as men and women. Right? And even talks to us in terms of different stages of our life, in terms of how we interact as a family. So the gospel frame, I just want you to see verse 1 and verse 15. He says what he's going to say. He says, but speak Uh, about the issues that are appropriate for sound teaching, he returns in verse 15 and says, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. So Paul makes it pretty clear to Titus that this material 
needs to be asserted, and he needs to assert it with authority, that this is true, this is important, and of course, for the people of God, it's not a matter merely of obeying God, it's a matter of coming to life as human beings, right? To obey God isn't a duty that's thrust upon us that somehow diminishes our life. To obey him and put him in the right place is actually to bring us to life. So that's the issue that he's calling for here. But he makes it here. Then in between that, in verses 2 through 10, he gives a gospel vision. Here's what uh, older men look like. Here's what older women look like. Here's what younger women look like. Here's what younger men look like. And then even talks about a a unique state, and we'll come to there in a moment. He talks about slaves and servants dealing with an institution that was part of the fallen world that was not built into creation, that's not ordained by God, but helping Christians live under adversity in a way that honors Christ. And then he gives the gospel roots in verses 11 through 14. Well, why should we live that way? Because you've been freed from the old identity that you used to be. You've been redeemed. You've been set apart to Christ, and you've been, had the grace of God, which is a power from God that teaches you to live into your new life, right? So this has been unleashed. So Jesus did everything to free you from the darkness of your past. Jesus has empowered you to live into this new life, and he's going to consummate it yet in the future. So everything that you long for, everything you've been created for, everything that he wants you to know in life, you're going to realize through Jesus Christ, now in this time, be those people for God's glory, for your blessing, to proclaim the nature of God's recreating work to the world, right? And what's interesting here is that our gospel proclamation as a church is tied to how men and women behave, how men and women treat each other how men and women talk to each other, how men view themselves as men, and how women view themselves as women. All that's tied to a gospel vision. So we'll come back to that. So in between, so let's walk through some of these and talk about some of the dynamics that we find. I'm not moving. Here we go. All right. So let's talk about godly older men. This is me, the old man, right? Godly older men. I just told my wife, driving here today, I made a little video for my uh, uh, well, youngest grandson at the time. I have a younger grandson in utero right now, but the uh, youngest uh, walking around grandson. So he's now starting to sing songs, the B-I-B-L-E, right? He's singing that one. And of course, the, the whole thing about the B-I-B-L-E song is the Bible part at the end. So well, I was listening to him sing it the other day, so I made a little video and I sang the B-I-B-L-E on him and sent it off to him so he could hear it, right? Right now, too, I don't have to worry about He's not aware of whether it's actually musically okay or not, so you can just, anybody can sing, right? So I sent it off to him, and I I told my wife, I'm sitting there looking at myself, reflected in my phone, and I said, that is an old man looking at me. Man, that's an old man, right? Who is that old man looking at me in that phone? Well, that was me, right? So somehow they don't have a filter to drop me back 30 years or something, but anyway... So here, here's what he says to old men. These are my, my renderings here and some explanations along those, but I just want to read those to you, right? These, he wants to, uh, people of his very own. This is what he calls us, his own people. This, he draws on an Old Testament imagery that God, when he sets his favor on us, makes us his own particular possessions. We're his own. And when God owns, owns things, he beautifies them. He frees them. He fills them, right? So we're his own people, and he he saved us from the darkness of the past to purify us, to enjoy a freedom from sin and its bondage. That's what he did for us, to free us from it. A wrong perspective on ourselves, a wrong perspective on him, a wrong perspective on our neighbor. He's freeing us for that, and he's inviting us to live into this new identity. So older men, you're to be self-restrained, Okay? And this is the idea that maturity, right, and self-restraint, well, well, what's the restraints? Well, the restraints are God's call on your life. Well, what is he calling you to be? He's calling you to be a man who loves Jesus, who follows Jesus, who reflects Jesus. A man who, who has women around him that feel safe, that he's not a predator. He has women around him that he's a man who's looking at them as women, and he's a safe person. He's a person who respects them and honors them. He's restrained, and notice it's a self-restraint. It's not an external restraint. 
It's not because you happen to have a whole bunch of other people around you keeping you from being who you are, but you want to be the kind of person that when you're sitting in front of your computer, when you're by yourself, when you're with a group of men, when you're out in some sort of environment, the same person shows up that's restrained by God's priorities for your life. So you self-restrain. You have an appropriate sense of what is important. The idea of respectable is a person who has a sense of what's important, and so he behaves in different environments in ways that reflect what's important. He doesn't blow up over inconsequential things, right? He doesn't have a little hobby horse that he rubs down on everybody all the time. He's not involved in, right, mansplaining forever, right, about everybody and everything. That's just not why he's not about elevating himself. He has a sense of what's appropriate in a given environment, right? What's appropriate to say, to a sister in Christ, what's appropriate to say to a brother in Christ, how you handle these situations, respectable, self-controlled, and that one in particular has the idea of sexually appropriate, someone who keeps their sexual appetites and desires within God's boundaries, right, which in, within Scripture is the only appropriate object, subject of your sexual desires as a man is, is the spouse that you're married to. So then vigorous in faith, right? Vigorous in here, the idea, I use the term vigorous, robust is the kind of idea that's here, is that you've got a faith that's alive, a faith that's, that's, that's growing, a faith that's constraining you and driving you in a vision for life. And love, right? You're known as a person who loves generously. And love, of course, we don't have enough time to develop all of these in terms of all the qualities. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're just, uh, uh, you know, uh, a guy who blubbers at every moment right, that you cry at every cool, you know, romantic scene in a movie. That's not what love, this is a tenacious quality that you want to, to move people toward Christ as Christ. Sometimes love has to rebuke. Sometimes love has to say no. Sometimes love cries. Sometimes it applauds. Sometimes it cheers, right? Sometimes it's just silent and present. But be just strong in it. And perseverance, there's a quality about your life that you don't give up when you go through reversals, Right? I was laughing yesterday. We got ready to go to the wedding, and we got a puppy at home. Right? This, you tell the, the difficulties of my life. Right? Uh, the little puppy at home. I got out of the shower, down the fo fo bottom floor. Ron is up and upstairs. She's showering. I get out of the shower, and I go to run upstairs to get dressed, and I'm close on time. And just before I get to the bottom step, I step in a puddle. And it goes splash. And I go, oh, oh, no. And then I cast my eyes over the kitchen and see little puddles everywhere. And, and Rana knows that it immediately just puts me in a just a praise the Lord state of mind. <laughs> right? When that happened, I was happy and I said, oh, this is so wonderful. No, and I was super aggravated. And then, of course, I had to spend time cleaning up, you know, a little puppy peewee off of the, off the floor. Right at the time, I, was, I had to pray on my way there to get myself in the right spirit because I just wanted to strangle something. Right? So... You know, I, I don't know what the thing, but to persevere, my faith shouldn't rise and fall like this all the time based on whether my job's going okay, based on whether my wife said the right things to me, whether she's treating me in the right way, whether my colleagues are doing the right. There ought to be some perseverance. There's some steadiness to it, right? And so older men are set forward. They should be a mark, older guys. We should be a mark for the young guys to shoot at. We should be a mark for them to shoot at, not some old curmudgeon, right, or irrelevant person, right, who's disconnected from the people behind us, right? Second, mothers and sisters, older women, in a similar way, are to be vigorous with respect to a reverent manner of life. Now, I underline that because that's the general category under which all of the other things fall, reverent, which the reverent idea is God-honoring, God-oriented, right? You're revering him, and that's the fundamental motivation that's driving you. All of our behaviors, men and women, as we read it, <clears throat> I'm trusting God by faith to live the way that he's calling me, both the fact that it's going to be blessing to me, and it's going to be a blessing to the people in my life. It doesn't mean that as I set off on it, it feels great to do it. I'm trusting him by faith to do that. As I step into that, I'm trusting him to do the things that he needs to do in my life and through my life for the sake of other people. But it's to revere him, right? So this means that they're not to be slanderers. They're not to be people who spend their time, 
right? Either elevating themselves or enjoying tearing apart other people or degrading other people or even building closeness and relationships by sharing some common ugly thing about another person. That's not a part of a godly woman. Her speech is not concerned with things that aren't redemptive. She speaks to the right person in the right way about the right things because she wants to affect it. And not enslaved to excess drinking. Okay? And here, of course, we could expand that. Not enslaved to any sort of, of addictive behavior, right? whether it's entertainment, whether it's romantic literature, whether it's any kind of substance, you're not addicted to those because you're not under that control. You've got God that's guiding your life. It's not your escape. It's not your way to deal with adversity. Right? It's not the default in your life. Right? And so this is the kind of idea. This is not characteristic of a woman who's following Christ. And one of the things that's interesting, I wrote to myself, older women and older men, they're not life in remission, right? There's the kind of cultural wisdom that's here is as you get older, right, you get into your 30s and 40s, you know, life is over. Life is over. Okay, as, you, as that happens, life is over, and you've, you've gone past it, suicide rates are high, right? The vision of life is like a youth vision of life, like there's nothing to be gained as you grow older, right? Especially if you give up on any universal truth or any real wisdom. Well, what wisdom is there to gather? What does an old person have to offer? And you see these sad examples of old people who try to reclaim their youth when it's obvious that they're not young or they look plastic trying to get young, Right? So the whole idea here is that, no, no, there's something to grow into. There's something rich that's ahead. And so you're on mission as an older woman. You're not in remission. You refuse to let the culture tell you what makes you valuable. And you, you're looking to Christ, right? You want a life that's full of him because you want to be a mark that the younger women are shooting at, right? I want to be like her. So rather... They're teachers. Look, they're looking behind them. They're trying to use the wisdom that God has taught them over the time. And some of the wisdom in God's grace is he's reclaimed our stupidity. He's saved us and reclaimed us when we made stupid uh, mistakes and we would made bad choices. But he's brought us to himself and forgiven us. And we've known the forgiveness and it's taught us. And now we want to bring that experience to bear for the blessing of people. We fell in a hole and we don't want them to fall in the same hole. So we're not hiding our past. We're not acting as if we didn't grow or need anything to happen. We're broken. But we've been redeemed by Christ. We've been sustained by him. And I want to testify to that. And I want to help the next generation not fall in the same pit by God's grace. Right? So they're teachers of what is God honoring. The good is what it says here. What is God honoring? So that they might train the young women to be husband lovers, to be children lovers. Okay? Now, with Paul... Okay, I want to say this is a caveat. Paul has a, if you want to read about it in 1 Corinthians 7, there is a role, there is a perspective in the New Testament that a person can be single and choose to serve God and be single. You don't have to be married to be faithful to God, right? But one thing that Scripture is, is really clear about is if you have a hostility toward marriage, that's not coming from above. Because marriage is a gift from God. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians First Timothy chapter 4, or you can have the teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. You can read about it. It's a gift from God, right? So the issue here is that it shouldn't be in the church. We don't force everyone to get married. We, for, we, want, we want to encourage everyone to follow Jesus and find the path that's right for them. But on the same hand, we don't deride marriage, and we don't cut it down, and we don't discourage our young people from getting married. One of my stump speeches, I said this the other day at the wedding, which is fitting there, at college. I probably said this to you before, but I tell my, my college students, I said, you know, our God is big and great and the mission is big and great. I just want to encourage you to go ahead and grow up. Just go ahead and grow up. Start taking on adult responsibility. Stop watching those TikTok things that tell you how adulting is, is a fail, Right? Embrace adulthood. Put the, put the responsibilities on your shoulder. Go home, right? Go home and be a changed person and let your mom cry because her little baby's grown up. 
Go home and don't behave like a kid. Go home and take responsibility. Right? The mission's big. Life, we got to step into it. Time is short. Right? So grow up. Right? And some of, for some people, step into the responsibility of marriage. Step into the responsibility of family. Step in there. If that's what God has for you, step in. Right? Have an appropriate sense of what's important, respectable, sexually chaste. Right? In a culture that has repudiated modesty as a virtue, believers should say, no, modesty, and this is another whole discussion, modesty is behaving toward a member of the opposite sex in a way that's appropriate given your relationship to them. Behaving toward a member of the opposite sex in a manner that's appropriate given the nature of your relationship to them. Right? For a husband and wife to be sexually intimate is completely modest. For a brother and sister to be sexually Im- intimate is completely immodest. Right? So as Christians, we ought to be people that are not drawing attention to ourselves deliberately or intentionally or unknowingly in ways that are inappropriate given the nature of the relationship we have to other people. So idea here, sexual chase, be caretakers of their homes, to be God-honoring, to submit to their own husbands so that God's message might not be represented, misrepresented or defamed. Now I want to say this last part. Sometimes, and I, uh, I want to say this because it appears three times, Some people say that when that last little phrase, that God's message might not be represented and defamed, some people treat that phrase as if the secular culture is going to be able to know whether you're living a gospel-centered life or not. And so they treat the secular culture as if it's the standard, and then Christians judge whether they're doing okay based on whether or not the secular culture says they're doing okay. I want to tell you that's flat out wrong. The standard that you need to is that does my life reflect the gospel? And the goal is I don't want to live as a husband or as a man that misrepresents God and the gospel. It doesn't mean that people in the secular culture will think I'm a good guy. They may think I'm a sexual prude or I'm a bigot, right? Or uh, often about Christian men, well, you guys talk about submission and headship, well, you must be an oppressor of women, right? All that, they may say, but they're not my goal. I just want to make sure that I'm living faithful to Jesus before them. Because I know, right, I have a biblical sexual ethic that doesn't affirm Pride Month. I don't hate people who struggle with those. I love them. I want them to come to know Christ. I think it's darkness and difficulty, right? Right? But I don't have a sexual ethic that looks at that and says, I can take pride in that. For me, it causes me to cry. It causes me to to pray. It causes me to engage and pray for them. But there's nothing to be proud about. Any more than for me to stand up here and say, I'm a sexually promiscuous husband. There's nothing prideful about that. And so when we come to this moment, I've got, I want to submit to his qualities so that when the world looks at me, they see a portrayal of what Jesus does when he recreates a man. And they see a portrayal of what he does when he recreates a woman. Now the culture may say, I don't like that. Right? And and Paul's aware of that. Many of you know this, right? The passage, 2 Corinthians, as you go about living your life, to some, you will be an aroma of life unto life. To others, you will be the stench of death. Okay? So the goal is, I'm not, how am I doing everybody out there? No, no. The goal is, am I faithful to Jesus, and then I let the chips fall where they may. Can you follow me? Right? Okay, now, move on. Godly young men. Young men, in a similar manner, you urge them to be sensible with respect to all areas of life by setting yourself forward as a pattern of God-honoring actions, right? This is one thing that gets here, the young guys, when I see uh, Brian coming up here, I look at Kyle in particular, no one knows, why are those guys so tall? I'm envious, right, at the moment. And so I was irritated, I saw Brian, Brian, how'd you get so tall? Uh, so it's not fair. I had all these tall uncles, I, you know, I told you this story, it's still this deep bitterness in my soul. I had to work this out with God. I have all these six, six plus foot uncles. And then I got to five foot 11 and then pff, I just you know, stayed there. And of course, as I get older, it gets worse, right? So, but I, I was always hoping to get to six foot, just, just never quite got there. Rick, sometimes when I'm working with him, he reminds me he's six foot one. It's not kind at all. Uh, I still try to love him as a friend. But 
you know, all those kind of things like that. I just, just never, never made it there, right? But the thing about being a young man here, it's not a time to play. It's not a time to be disengaged. It's not a time to goof off. It's not a time to waste your life. It's time to prepare, right, to step into life. Step up, right? So you urge to be sensible with respect to all areas of life by setting yourself forward as a pattern of God-honoring actions. It's not something that's for the old guys. That's something for the young guys, right? As having integrity in your teaching, right? So this for Titus was, Titus, what you're going to commend to these young men and what you're going to commend to these people, you better be living it. Don't you go telling them to do something and then they look at your life and they're going, look at Titus's life, Right? This is the hard thing, you know, as a young man, if you're in a group of your friends or you're around other people and you go talking about what's important to you and things that you think is right, well, then the hard thing is you actually have to live it out in front of them. When they think it's stupid or the cry is going the other direction, cause integrity, right? So uh, appropriate seriousness, right? A sense of the gravity of life. I'll say this in terms of your dating relationships, young men. You should not be messing with women. You should have an appropriate sense of the weightiness of human relationships. Right? You can mess around with somebody and mess them up deeply for life. Right? You should have a weightiness about that. So you should have a sense that I want to treat her in a way that looks like Jesus. And if I walk away, I don't want to make my relationship with her harder to see what a good man is by the way I treated her. I want her to know a good man. I want to treat her in the right way. So I restrain myself. I don't invite her into uh, being a wife when she's a sister. So I don't want to be involved with her sexually. All those kind of things, right, are part of what it calls to be, have an appropriate weight about the seriousness of life. A life-giving message which is above criticism so that opposition may be ashamed because they have nothing evil to say about you. Okay? A consistency of life with the gospel. Now this last one here, and I'm going to spend a lot of time here, but what Paul is dealing with here is careful. He's dealing with a sinful institution not designed or approved by God. But he's dealing with a real category of people that were a major segment of the early church. Right? Life was changed for them in very dramatic ways. And so he's dealing with a group of people and he's saying uh, to Christians who live under real adversity, who live in real dark places, which is the truth for many Christians around the world today. Some are actual slaves. Some are living under governments that treat their uh, 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 members of their country as slaves, right? And so they're oppressed, they're denied their privileges, they're abused, they're put into impoverished situations uh, by no fault of their own. All those kind of things are happening. So he's speaking to Christians in this fallen world until Christ returns how to live in these kinds of situations of adversity. And so what he wants them to be is he's calling them, right, that they truly are, the irony here, is that they've been redeemed. And so when you had a, 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 a saved slave and an unsaved master, you had the freed man and the true slave who was the master. Because to be redeemed is to be bought back from slavery to sin. This is what Christ did. He bought him back. The true threat to the slave and the master alike is their sin against God. The slave is the only one who knows that freedom. And so he's truly free. And one day, when Christ returns, there will be vindication and judgment. So he knows ultimately all things will be righted. So, but he wants him to live as a Christian, even in this adversity, right? Be pleasing in terms of your work, right? Don't crap on the things that you're doing so that you pay back people. Don't be obstinate. Don't be thieves. Demonstrating good faith so the teaching of God, Savior, might be glorified. Now, what is at the heart of the gospel? Okay, think with me. What is the heart of the gospel? Romans chapter 5. Think about this, verses 5 through 8. Perhaps for a good man, someone might die. Someone might die for a righteous person. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's asking them to sacrifice for the sake to 
convey honor on the dishonorable, to love to the uttermost for the sake of those who need Jesus. So let your life speak to the fact that you don't fear what they fear, that you recognize that your freedom is not tied to their behavior, that you testify to him. So, and Christians in adversity. Now, finally then, he comes to this, the gospel roots, right, which we read. Each group, to fill it out here, should live this way because God's grace has appeared in Christ to bring salvation to all people. Well, that's a reference to the coming of Jesus, right, to bring salvation through the cross and the resurrection. It's appeared, and by faith you've entered into the benefits of his death, and you've entered into the benefits of the life that he won, right? He did this to train us so that we would deny ungodliness and worldly passions, and we would live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, while we eagerly anticipate the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he gave himself for us to redeem us, to buy us back from slavery, from every type of lawlessness, and purify for himself a people of his very own, eager to do something that honors God, right? So that's the people of God that we are. We're eager to do something that honors God. And in the context of this passage, it's I want to be this kind of man. I want to be this kind of woman. I want to be this kind of young woman. I want to be this kind of young man. I want to face adversity in this kind of way. So what he's talking about. Now, let me come and fill in your blanks. So if you have some blanks to fill in, and these will be all of the crazy radical things I'm going to say right here at the end. Some are going to say this is like a duh moment, but I'm just going to go through them. Okay? Gospel men and women. One, God's grace... His saving favor is creating a new culture. Okay? It's creating a new culture. It's making people who are different from the culture around them. It's not just forgiving you of your sins. It's making you someone new. It's restoring the humanity that's been lost in the fallenness that you've experienced in your sin. It's restoring you not only as a human being we're going to talk about, but it's restoring you as a man, and it's restoring you as a woman. Okay, So, new culture. Two, God's grace is equally available to men and women. Okay, this is the key thing here, is there's no hierarchy in God's saving work. He doesn't elevate men above women. He doesn't prefer one above the other. God's grace is equally available. All men and women, right? This is one of the things that happens sometimes. Uh, I love the women in my life. And, you know, we were taught when we were young, right, that women are, you know, what's the sugar and spice and everything nice, right? And, and boys are, what's the other side of that? I can't remember it. Snails and puppy dog to whatever, right? All kinds of gross things, right? That kind of thing like that. But you know, I love the women in my life, but you know, there are no perfect women in my life. I know that's a surprise. But you know, women are sinners, and men are sinners. They don't sin in all the same ways. They don't have the same physical abilities to exercise their anger against each other in the same way. But all women and all men struggle struggle with pride. They struggle with lust. They struggle with anger. They struggle with gluttony and lack of self-control. They struggle, right, with all the things that we know that are a part of, with envy. Man, we live in a culture that is awash in envy. Some of the young women in particular, because of what's being portrayed to them on Instagram, are so envious of what they see and are recognizing their inability to actually be able to conform to the image that they see, that they're despairing of life altogether and giving up on life. There's even a a lawsuit that's happening right today where parents are suing Instagram for the influence they've had on their 11-year-old daughter who's despaired of life. Now, I think there's more blame than Instagram to go around there. But the issue is, is going on is she's despairing of life because she's set before this all the time. And that's the ideal. That's who I need to be. That's who I should be if I really matter. But I can't attain it. And so I'm in despair of it. And they're giving up on life. So God, he's an, he loves men and women. And he died for the sins of women. 
and he died for the sins of men. Right? So he loves men and women. God's grace is equally necessary for men and women. Equally necessary for men and women. You need, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I, I hope you're a kind person. I hope you're a nice person. I hope all those things. But the deepest change that needs to happen, the most fundamental thing that you need to be freed from is the bondage to your sin. And it may even be, for many people, your pride in the fact that you think you're good without God. So God says, no, you need a deep renovation because you need to be changed because at the core of you, the fundamental disorientation of your life is you think you can be good apart from me. You think you can make it on your own. And essentially, you've made yourself God and deposed me. You have been created for me for your blessing and your good. So God's grace is necessary. God's grace transforms both men and women toward a common vision of the good life, right? So here, this is why as a community, we come together. And uh, this is one, I think, in, as, as we've gone through the studies, this is one set of verses that really got a hold of Rana in terms of the Titus 11 uh, 2, 11 to 14, and still when we pray together, she prays from Titus 2, 11 to 14 all the time. And she's very kind. She doesn't pray it directly at me. She just prays it, right? But, you know, the, the whole idea is that we're praying, you know, God, God said today that you've been empowered by Christ, you've been made a new creation, and you've been given the resources of the Holy Spirit so that you can say no to ungodliness today. You can say no. He wants you to say no. He wants you to choose differently. You don't have to speak back in anger to your husband that way. You don't have to make that little cutting comment so that you can just get a little, a little cut in, right? You don't have to, to let your mind drift into that area where you're consuming a woman in your mind that you shouldn't be thinking about. You don't have to do that, right? The, your insecurities and fears that are keeping you back from following Christ, you, you don't have to let those win. You don't have to be consumed by worry. And Chris is going to help us men not to be there right? So all those kind of things, you don't have to be. So, but it's a common vision, the same thing for women. It may look a little bit different, but we're all trying to be God's own special people. That's a common vision. And so I'm loving the women in my life, and the men are loving me in my life to be toward a common vision. We want to look like Jesus and represent Jesus, right? And then God's grace transforms men as men and women as women, okay? Now, this is the, uh, the controversial things here, um, I don't have time to develop all this because I'm, I'm about to run out of time. There's so many things to talk about here. But God does not, when he saves you as a man or saves you as a woman, he doesn't create some androgynous humanity. Even though we equally need God's grace, we're equally valued by God, he doesn't strip us of the distinctiveness of being male and female when we come. Matter of fact, he wants to redeem it and have us contribute it to reflect the fullness of his image as men and women. And so one of the things you find is he sets certain uh, social structures, certain social boundaries that women operate in and men operate in. And he wants us to live within those for our protection and blessing. So God's grace restores masculinity and femininity, and this is another discussion we need to have. But men and women are not treated the same. You notice that there's different guidance for men and women. They're not treated the same because they're not the same. Right in the culture, uh, on the one hand, right, our culture is trying to tell us that, uh, you know, men and women are just alike. They can, you know, a woman can do anything a man can do. And then we have the Me Too movement right, about basically the Me Too movement is asking, right, from people who don't believe it, asking men to behave like Puritans, like people who are shaped by a biblical sexual ethic, that we don't go after and pursue women as predators, that we don't try to exploit them, we don't try to pursue them, we don't try to use our strength over against them. That seems to be something that speaks to the difference between men and women, and so we don't deny that. And one of the things that we have in the culture, men and women are different. They react differently to things, right? And again, I'm talking in generalities, but the culture has, instead of us being able to speak in generalities, has pulled on the exceptions to try to undermine the whole concept. Well, you don't know my Aunt Mabel. She was, you know, 6'5 and could wield an axe and chop down three trees, 
right? So how can, you know, how does that look like femininity, right? Okay, well, yeah, there's also, you know, small little guys over here, right, that, that need to be carried outside, whatever, okay? I'm not talking about there's different characteristics of people, different attitudes, different temperaments, but nobody gives up on the concept that there are men and there are women. There's two categories, right? Masculinity and femininity has a breadth, but we're not trying to offend by speaking, right, to say that you have to look exactly like this or do these particular things. But there's two things, right? Like the old analogy, we don't know exactly where the sea meets the shore. If you've ever been to the seashore, it's hard to tell where does the shore begin and where does the sea begin, and it depends on the tides. But nobody gives up on the concept of the shore and the sea. Follow me, right? So nobody gives up. So they're not treated the same, and they're not replaced or added to. Okay. Now I, I say this with, with with tenderness and with concern for you if you've been caught up in all this kind of thing. There aren't any more categories than male and female. Now that's that, in many situations I, I would just be you're a hater, Greg. You're, you're just you're trying to erase me is the term. You're trying to erase my identity. And of course, from a biblical point of view, from Christ's point of view, I'm saying, no, no, I, by God's grace, I'm trying to hold on to reality for your sake. I'm trying to hold on to reality for your sake. I do it with tears in my eyes. I do it with concern for you, but I'm trying to hold on to it for your sake because you're being swept up in a tide of lies. So I'm going to hold on to it. And we in the church, right, I'll tell you, it's going to come to our shores, it may be even affecting us right now. Already, and this is, this is I mean, this might be 10 years ago, Ron and I attended a, a, a wedding of one of my colleagues where his son came out as a woman at his sister's wedding. Okay? So, it's, it's at our shores. It's affecting our kids. I'm telling you, parents, if you're letting your kids have unfettered access through the phone to the internet, Stop it. And, and I was, you, you don't know how, it, well, you own that phone, you pay for that phone, you need to shut it down. And I know that's strong, I know that's strong, but the filth and the stuff that's available to them all the time, and it's being catered to them. It's being catered to them, right? You should not be letting them have unfettered access to that. Right? If you have to go back to get one of those old silly phones that the only thing it can do is call your number. Right? Well, they're going to be so weird. Yes, they are. But they won't be broken and polluted by all the crap that's going on. So I'm, I'm telling you, this, it's a time and a moment where everything up here is craziness in the secular world. Okay? Now, by God's grace, it's not crazy here. And most of you aren't walking out right at this moment. But, but we're in a moment where we, by God's grace, we want to affirm our men need to be grown as men. They need to be gospel-shaped men, and our women need to be grown as women. We have a women's discipleship council where women come together to think about how do we disciple and grow our women. Beginning with radical discipleship with the men in years past, uh, Van kind of spearheaded this. We got it up and running. Now Chris and, and Glenn are kind of carrying it forward. We got groups of men. I mean, we need to have men who are having conversations about what it means to be a man in a moment where what it means to be a man has been lost. And many young men are just being told, you know, your masculinity is toxic, right? You're a harm. You're a danger. You're all these kind of things like that. And you've got a lot of depressed, disconnected, unhappy men. You got a lot of women. This is the interesting here. If you take satisfaction surveys on men and women, they're unhappier than they've ever been. So by God's grace, we want to have gospel-shaped men and gospel-shaped women. Okay, would you stand with me and we're going to pray. Now let us go. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the evidence of your work. Um, Lord, in seeing uh, these two uh, young men uh, come to the end of uh, their time of uh, undergraduate schooling, and just to see them uh, reach that goal and step forward, Lord, we pray for Ben, we pray for Brian. Lord, would this be the beginning uh, of a life of following you? Lord, would you wake them to the weightiness and the goodness 
uh, and the mission uh, that you're up to in the world, Lord, would it consume them, catch them up? Lord, would that be true of us as men and women here? Lord, would you help us to love each other well? Would help us to stand in the face of, of just a sad cultural uh, tide? Lord, help us to stand with compassion, with love, with grace, with yearning. At the same time, Lord, firmly, Lord, on the truth to call people, uh, Lord, to reality uh, and ultimately to Jesus. And so, Lord, thank you for all you've given us. Thank you for the people who've gone before us that have given us uh, the legacy that we have. Lord, we know we've not always been good. We've not always done it right. We know we haven't failed. But, Lord, we, put, we pray, Lord, help us, Lord, to persevere and stay at what you've called us to do and to be. Pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.